Very good. <laughs> and you go to centers and then devotional space from that website. There are different tabs. The first one? The first one, yeah. Okay. And during the break, too, I had, had uh, someone come up to me and mention about the, the movie last night, or the, the Star Trek episode. It was quite intense. Yeah. And I think um, those kind of, uh, of movies or, or, or episodes are, they really do kind of bring the ego out of its, its hiding place. Because it's so used to hiding in the dark shadows, but when we have something so direct that pretty much shows you the whole big picture in one showing, then a lot of times the ego gets stirred up and is, it, it could be bring up some very intense emotions. So I wanted to start with, with that, if there's still some um, questions. Uh, we were talking this morning that there was a lot that happened at the end of that with, with Captain Janeway, you know, coming being very direct with the ego, but also it was a sense of, of her being in, in safety, not being uh, in stasis, not being sleeping, not being at the mercy of the ego, which all the characters that went in there with the clown character, you know, he says, I know everything, and I know all your, you know, all their, their fears, their insecurities, their memories, and would use those fearful memories to scare them, uh, to keep them whenever they try to think of escaping. And so that's quite a strong parallel with what we're dealing with in our lives and working with the Course. That the Course is very direct and these kind of movies or episodes are very direct and then it's very common in retreats for some volatile emotions to come up because they've been pushed down. And this is a way of saying, oh, it's time for healing. It's time to let those up, in a safe context. Mm -hmm. And that's the most important thing. So if there are any follow-up questions around the end of that movie, or any kind of uh, questions or clarifications that are, are required, I'd like to address those. Yes, yeah, so the last part, it was not her herself. But it was an <coughs> image of her, or I, I didn't get that precisely. How would we translate that to what we can do? Yeah, it was, it was like called a hologram, so it looked <coughs> real, it looked three-dimensional. Um, <coughs> I think I was using the metaphor of back in the time of Jesus where it seemed like there was this man with a a robe and long hair that was walking around on planet Earth. And then even after the crucifixion, when the body was, was put in the tomb and then the, the seal was broken and the stone was rolled away, and then uh, Jesus came back and made more appearances. Uh, there's a book called the Arantia book where I believe it, it, there was a number of, of appearances Mm -hmm. where Jesus came back and did teaching and speaking. And in that book it said he, he didn't have a, a regular body. He had a marantia body, it was called, where it looked human. It looked mm -hmm. completely human, but it didn't have any heart pumping and any blood mm -hmm. going through it. It was, it was put together by the angels uh, as a teaching device when he made his appearances before he as the Bible said, ascended back to God the Father. So, uh, that you could say the same with Captain Janeway, that she, her mind wasn't in stasis, so she wasn't asleep, and she was programmed to respond to the, the clown character, mm -hmm. the ego character, but she was in no danger, uh, because she wasn't sleeping. Ah, yeah. uh, she was, she was a, our Holy Spirit representation, in that movie, of what, how the ego finally was transcended by the Spirit, by the, by the Spirit, using a device, but not, uh, not really on the, on the system, on the system, but not in stasis. So, that's, that's what that was at the very end. It was an appearance of Captain Janeway.
Yes. When a movie like uh, the movie yesterday gives you nightmares, um, do you have to do something with them, or can you just think? Well, it's always interesting with nightmares to just to kind of pay attention to the feelings because the fear is always coming from uh, a fearful interpretation. And really that's what we're working with the Holy Spirit on, is help purifying our interpretation. Because we don't really interact with this world directly, it's more like there's all these images and then the ego is given a meaning and so there's like a filter or an interpretation that that is where the struggle comes in. So the Holy Spirit is helping us purify the filter by which we're viewing the world. And then you get more and more to a point where you don't buy into the thoughts. And then you notice your experiences in the world change. For example, when I was much younger, uh, uh, my parents would take me to an amusement park with roller coaster rides, and I was always afraid of the roller coaster rides. They went so fast, and they, you know, your body just got rolled around. So, so I avoided the roller coaster rides, and then I think when I was probably in my twenties, I thought, well, it's time for me to face. My fear of roller coasters, so I got on it, and my heart was pounding, and my body was thrown all over the place. And so that was a pretty intense experience. And then I remember working with the chorus for many years, and a, a friend from uh, Cedar Point, Ohio, invited me uh, to this amusement park after I'd worked with the chorus for many, many years. And uh, she was there, her daughter was there, and I went on all these. Uh, roller coaster rides, and the body was turned in every which way, and upside down, and hanging, and all this and this. And I noticed it didn't bother me at all. I was just like, well, enjoying the ride. I, I, my mind had had kind of let go. And then I went into this. Uh, it was kind of a, a cinema where where it's uh, very tall, like three stories high, and you go into this room, and they project this big screen of like being on the back of a fire engine uh, ladder and, and sweeping around uh, <coughs> on hang gliding and all these things. And they had metal bars there uh, when they showed you, you could walk in and stand there and I said, what are, what are the metal bars for? Well, when they started showing the film, people were grabbing each other and falling to the floor and holding on to the metal bar because their perceptions were that they were being swung around all over the place. And I just noticed that I was just standing there and, and people were grabbing onto my legs and, and, and holding on to the bar like this, even though the floor wasn't moving, nothing was there. It was just showing how, how it's our perceptions that, that throw us off balance. It's our interpretations. So I was quite impressed. I thought, wow, the course is working. Uh, because you don't really know how much it's working until you're put in situations where there's a sharp sound or something, a snake comes out or a big spider drops down from the floor or something that you might have reacted to before and you notice you're not reacting, you're just kind of watching. And that's part of what the mind training is about, to, to become more in your experience with the Holy Spirit and detached from the world, so that you can be the observer. You can just watch the dream without reacting and responding to it. So, yeah, I would say that that episode yesterday was quite an intense episode. It's not uncommon. Some people have said, wow, that clown character was freaky and bizarre, and it, it did stir up some unconscious fears. And occasionally it could stir up a, a nightmare or whatever, in the sense of... Uh, but, but we have to look at the whole context. That's part of the reason why uh, Helen and I sang Little Ego, <laughs> was to try to give you a context to remember that, that it depends on your mind for its existence. You're not really dependent on it. And it would want you to be afraid of it, but 
the more we work with the spirit, we get more confident in seeing, <coughs> you can't fool me, you know, like the song said, uh, that you have no existence, you know, it, it ultimately gets purged and overcome that way. Yes? So, just, I, I just want to hear it again from you, something like that. So that, um, like the analogy in the end of the Star Trek episode, uh, the Holy Spirit comes in, fearless, there's no fear with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is awake and facing the fear. So what I, what is my job then? I I feel fears and I invite the Holy Spirit, but I also have to face the fears. I have to be aware, coming being aware of it and the feelings around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what's my job? How how does it work the best way? Well your job is just to have the willingness to not hide and protect the, the dark feelings or the dark thoughts and beliefs anymore. In other words, it's by having defense mechanisms and protecting them that they stay hidden. And when they stay hidden, then you still feel at the mercy. Uh, Carl Jung was a very famous psychologist and he talked about the shadow. It's that unconscious uh, set of beliefs that uh, it, it can be daunting when you start to get on a spiritual journey and you start to face these unconscious thoughts and beliefs. It can be overwhelming. Uh, I know when I was, I was not involved in a relationship uh, during high school. I was not involved in a relationship in my early 20s and my mid 20s until I think I was 20 seven years old, when I was in my first relationship. And I was also in graduate school. So I kind of went into ego overwhelm when during a relationship all these unconscious feelings came flushing up. And with the seeming pressure of graduate school, uh, papers and exams and presentations and like floods of things coming on, uh, when I first started working with the Course, I had so much emotional darkness that came up, and it was so intense, that I just thought, how do people do this? How, how can people have jobs and careers? How, how do people have relationships and go on a spiritual journey of awakening? I don't, I don't get it. I mean, I, I had been so denied and repressed that when it came up, and I thought, oh, in grad school on top of it, you know, like, yeah, thank you, Holy Spirit, you know, just, why not just throw the whole, throw it all on me at once? Uh, I just wanted to like stay under my covers and not go out. Because <laughs> I thought, I'm going to get triggered all day from this stuff. And then, uh, and then the first relationship that the Holy Spirit sent me, uh, the woman was, was a fundamentalist Christian. Uh, there's the Calvinist past coming back at us. You know. It's like, thank you. Okay, you really want to flush this up in a hurry, you know. And so, with her and her churches and her parents and you know, heaven and hell and fire and damnation and oh God, you know. And, and graduate school on top. Oh come on, come on. How do you expect me to do this? So, it was very intense and. And generally, that's what happens when you start working with the Course. The more that you build your confidence and invite the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is, is like going to say, well, okay, we have to, we have to not protect those dark thoughts and beliefs. That's the only thing you have to be willing to do is not protect them. Not stuff them back down, or not distract away from them. Let them come up into awareness. It would be like if you were like a dentist and, you know, you had a tooth with a cavity or an abscess or uh, where, you, where disease had seemed to go down into the root and you needed like a root canal. You know, a root canal is it's a, it's a delicate kind of thing where you have to go all the way down into the roots of the tooth because of the, the decay 
uh, is going on. And you might say this is the same with our mind. That as long as we have this unconscious belief system that's down there, we have to get at the decay that's underneath. There's no point in trying to keep, fix, arrange and rearrange this, the characters on the surface and arrange the effects when there's, at the level of mind, at the level of causation, is where the issues are. That's where the beliefs are. That's where the attack thoughts are. It's not the people. The ego would have us run away from certain people or try to get certain people out of our lives and so on and so forth. But, but to really face those those emotions, those thoughts, and those beliefs. It's, it's so important. In fact, um, some of the books that I have, I think one of them is in Awakening Through Course in Miracles, we have this Instrument for Peace, which, which is a worksheet designed to help you go through with your emotions. It's in one of the <coughs> books right there. Facing your, your emotions, your perceptions, your emotions, your thoughts, and then ultimately your beliefs to help you get down to the root. Because the ego itself is a belief, and it sponsors this belief in linear time, and as long as the mind is addicted to this time belief, it's afraid of eternity. Because eternity and time can't really coexist. One's real, and one isn't. And so when the mind's trying to, to play both sides, or believe in both, it, it's very uneasy, it's very intense in the mind. So, over the years, I've just worked with things like music and movies and things that inspired me. And then when people have said, well, what's the fastest way to salvation or enlightenment? I said, well, relationships and silence. I mean, if you have a combination, if you've got a meditation practice and you have relationships going on, then that's going to be the fast track. Because the ego is going to get flushed way out of its, it's like flushing hornets out of a hornet's nest. You know, you, you stick the stick in there and you move it around and then all these hornets come flying out. That's kind of what happens when you use a combination of, of silence and relationships. Because the ego hates silence. Um, that's why a lot of times when people go off into monasteries, convents, or yoga practices, meditation practices, you know, it, it's stirred up. The ego doesn't like silence. And then relationships, there's so much mirroring that goes on, that it's like having a very close mirror right in front of you, just mirroring everything back. It could be with interpersonal relationships, the parent-child relationships, you know. Oftentimes, even with, with employees or, or employers and bosses, authority figures, you know, it's a lot of anger and rage just comes up in those kind of contexts because there's so much mirroring going on. So, I think that was another aspect of the Star Trek episode, is the whole idea of, of going into this artificial world and seeing the dynamics. They're all wearing masks, they're always dancing and partying, <coughs> but it's kind of like partying out of, out of guilt. They're afraid. They're afraid to, to escape, they're afraid to, to live, so they're trying to make happy, pretend happy. But they're all wearing masks, and it, I just found it a particularly good metaphor yes. for, for planet Earth, when I saw those characters dancing around, yeah. yes. and we're, we're looking for someone, you know, they're, they're in another town, and the woman, the little woman says, uh, there are no other towns. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. like, this is what we're dealing with here, it's this, this just game playing, a lot of game playing going on, and a lot of false partying we have to cut through. Yeah. Okay, so, any other... Really, the prayer is to join with the Holy Spirit, 
help me see this differently, you know, ask for guidance and help on that. And know that for the first aspect of forgiveness, that there'll be a lot of uncovering and exposing. That's just the way it's going to go. It will get, it will go beyond that. You will go more to consistently aligning with the Holy Spirit. And when you do that, you're able to overlook the error. It says in the Course, the Holy Spirit overlooks the defiled altar and looks to the light of the atonement. So that's ultimately where you come closer to Christ's vision, when you get more and more practice at looking with the Holy Spirit and overlooking the error, overlooking the defiled altar. So, you might say though that it still comes down to a willingness to not hide and protect because if you're not willing to hide and protect, then they are going to disappear. They will vanish, as Captain Janeway said. Eventually he does vanish, and then the ego goes thrapped. Because it's game over, to use a, a game analogy. Game over when there's, there's no protecting and hiding. So ultimately you want relationships where you can just speak what's on your mind. You can, you can feel a safety and a security there. And why, why relationships? Because if you can do it with, with another human being, so to speak, then you can do it with the Holy Spirit. It's just doing it with another human being is a symbol of your willingness to not hide and protect. Because from the ego's mind training and the ego's training, we have we've been scared to expose these thoughts and beliefs for fear that we'll lose our relationships. Like if I expose this, then they'll either use it against me, it'll come back to haunt me, and, or it'll be used to sabotage and expose the relationship. And there's such a fear of losing the relationship that the mind puts a lid on the darker emotions and seals it tight. Like, no, I will never go there, I'll never look at that. But then no healing occurs if the, if the mind is so sealed tight. So anything that you can do that kind of allows it up, usually with a trusted friend or a partner that you really love and trust, then that helps letting those thoughts up. And then really you're letting them up to the Holy Spirit. And as soon as they come to the Holy Spirit, they're gone. It's not like the Holy Spirit has to wrestle the ego or something. <laughs> it's like, as soon as the darkness comes to the light, they're gone immediately, they vanish immediately. So that's why it's so important not to hide and protect them. And to, have, to slowly develop trust and faith that you can do this. I can, I can let these up. This is helpful. And that's why we started this practice with these expression sessions. It's expression sessions, the Holy Spirit is just smiling going, great, now we can really get to the core of healing. The ego is going to be going, no, this is risky business. This is, risky. this is like laying down sticks of dynamite all around and hoping you don't step on one and set off a booby trap or something like this. Uh, the ego likes to just keep things smoothed over and pushed down out of awareness. So this kind of communication is, is precious and it does take a while to get used to it.
So I'm very, uh, I feel very connected. And sometimes when I sing, it's like whole, whole cultures come out of my voice. You know, it goes very far. And I have this idea in my mind that there are still people on the planet that really live in the harmony and live in the spirit and live in the devotion of everything that is around them. And I was just wondering, what are your thoughts about that? So I, do I project my happy dream on those things? Or do I in those moments, because I also have very strong dreams, do I in those moments connect with something or is it also all my projection? It's just, how does all of that come together yeah. with the Holy Spirit? Yeah, I, I would say that, yeah, for you, the, the indigenous people are, are a witness of spirit. Uh, and there's, there's indigenous people, the, like uh, the Indians in, in Brazil, the Indians in, in uh, Canada, the United States, the Aborigines, uh, the Aborigines down in um, uh, Australia. Uh, they, the Jesus is telling us that this world is backwards and upside down. So everything throughout history that has been under the name of civilization, the Industrial Revolution, bigger guns, bigger weapons. Um, one of my favorite Star Trek movies, we watched the Star Trek episode, but there's actually full, full length Star Trek movies, two hour movies. And one of them, I think it's called Insurrection, I believe it is, and, and it's uh, Captain Picard, and, and they, they come to this planet uh, to help these people. They think they're primitive. And so the Enterprise, they land there, and they're there to help protect them from invading forces, and they, they seem to be primitive. They're, you know, children playing, and, and they're growing crops, and so on and so forth. And, they assume that these people don't have technology. They just assume it by the way they're looking. Actually, they, they have warp drive capabilities. They have some of the highest technological abilities. They choose not to use them. In fact, at one point, uh, the woman tells Captain Picard, uh, where is there to go? When he's all excited about warp drive and exploring, gal she says, where is there to go? Uh, you know, that's her answer. <laughs> and he's a bit suspicious. Uh, but then at one point, she goes deep into a mystical experience, like the Holy Instant, and slows down all of time and space. And, and he goes in with her into this experience of deep love. And it totally contradicts everything that he believes about being a captain and and civilization, and power, and all the things that he thinks are important as part of, uh, you know, Starfleet, they're all wiped out in these experiences. So it's, I think, the same thing with, with the Aboriginals and with a lot of the Natives. They, they are the advanced ones, actually. They are at the top of advancement, and the ones that are supposedly this advanced civilization are very backward. It's all flipped around. And we also see it with the children that are being born, because, you know, in our generations we're seeing um, uh, star children being born, and we're, we're seeing children that, that are demonstrating uh, advanced psychic capabilities, disinterest in ambition, disinterest in society, uh, trying to, to fit in or trying to advance and achieve, they're, they're actually witnesses of the Spirit too. They're like teachers. But the world categorizes them as, you know, learning deficits and attention deficit. It's just got a bunch of diagnosis for these like indigo children that are showing up. In fact, there's a great movie in our Movie Watchers Guide to Enlightenment called Lucy. And at the end, I was at the theater, I watched Lucy, the spectacular movie. I, I was watching the credits roll and the credits roll and listening to the songs. I like to always stay in the theater and listen. And I waited in there, I told everybody who was with me, no, let's wait, something's coming. 
They said, it's over, David. The movie's over. It's just the credits. No, wait. So the, here comes all the credits, credits, and then, then the song comes on, God's Whisper. Oh, yeah. And I hear God's whisper. I am the Savior. We are indigo. And the whole song is from the indigos, which is great, because the whole movie is really about the indigos and, and advancing in consciousness, and not in material means, or not in advancing in learning, or the ways of the world, but in spiritual consciousness. So, yeah, I think that's beautiful, that you're, you feel that connection, you're putting yourself in a position where you can sing, <laughs> sing it through, and in a lot of the, the indigenous people, you know, the, the elders and the tribes, there's been singing and dancing and all kinds of mechanisms in place that are very helpful for spiritual awakening. And to, to modern day civilization, they seem like just a bunch of rituals. Yeah. You know, it's different. Because yesterday I felt uh, to be a little bit away from the electricity, that's why I wanted to go to the woods. And I was touching some trees and just breathing with some trees. And, and I have a, a strong feeling of, of going back deep in the garden with no electricity. And if I now shower, I start to spontaneously sing for the water, to thank the water. So I'm really living the happy dream. But I'm also thinking my uh, my apartment, and I I wrote outside of my wall that nobody can see. I am spirit. I am spirit. So it's like, uh, and then I was imagining maybe someone comes and live there in 30 years when I'm dead or, or later. Then if you find a stone and you and you see written on it, I am spirit. That must be so much fun, you know. <laughs> so uh, I'm trying to yeah to. To translate this deep, deep longing of living in the jungle, which now is not possible at the moment, but still, I'm imagining I'm already there, and so many voices come through me, and so many wisdom, and, and being thankful for for all the materials in my life. I have been in a relationship with a man from Argentina for eight years, and I was complaining about my loneliness. It was like eight, nine years ago. And he opened my eyes in saying, like, but everything that we see here, you know, like this, this podium, this, this material, it is made by thousands of people, thousands of spirits cooperating together. So whenever you are in your house and you feel lonely, just start to count the objects and imagine the truck driver, the one who made it, the one who sold it, the one who packed it, the one who cleaned it, the one who invented it. So even in the material world, you can all the time feel the connection of, uh, yeah. of spirit. And then, probably I prefer now to feel that connection in the nature, but he opened my eyes to see that even in, who uh, that cement in the, in the city, it's the same net, the same invisible net is there to tap into. So, uh, but I love that in the avatar of the tree and how all the trees under the ground are connected. And I just wanted to stay with the blue guys there. And, uh, <laughs> I really didn't want to leave the, the oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think many people have that. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you, that's Thank beautiful. You. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's, that's some of the, the largest, I think they said the largest organism on the planet is a, is a grove of, of trees. Uh, the, the root system is all connected, and it's, yeah. it's literally one organism, but it's massive. Most people don't think of trees as the largest organism on the planet, but it's that interconnectivity that's there, and all the energy that's there. And so it's good. It, I think it's good to practice, like with with whatever comes your way. And I can see where this relationship has been a uh, like heart expanding and mind opening. And that's really the prayer of the heart. You know, the ego wants us to use relationships to stay asleep. Yeah. Uh, just to find artificial agreements and artificial pursuits and interests, interests to, to stay together. And then the real prayer of the heart is, help me open up, help me expand. Yeah. Anything that will expand perception, expand awareness, is, is extremely helpful. 
And then you feel this gratitude, like so much gratitude for that. Yes. Yes. Yes, I have a question. Um, we've been doing these uh, expression sessions in groups. Is there maybe is there maybe also time to uh, to do it in pairs to practice uh, with two pairs? I would like that to to uh, take home as well. It's easy to continue that way to practice with somebody else. Okay, well that's... I forgot the... I, I, don't know, I don't remember all the guidelines. I, mm -hmm. So I would like to uh, practice that again. That's a request. I think for this afternoon, this is our last kind of free afternoon, and so uh, <coughs> tomorrow we, we close at five, so we'll probably have some type of a closing uh, in the afternoon tomorrow, but I think this afternoon is pretty wide open. There's been some interest in taking some bikes to the sea, you know, to the, to the sand, to the sea, to the beach. There has been an interest where was talk, we talked about biodanza, and we talked about um, maybe an experiential session, um, more like an angel bath, but, but certainly what you're describing um, I call it dyad work, whereas you just have two people sitting. What do you call it? Dyad. It's just two, it's two people coming together to, to do this op heart opening experiences. It's very, very helpful. So maybe uh, as we wind down today, we can just kind of, um, at the end of this session, we'll just kind of get a show of hands of who's interested in what. Because everything's available. We're tailoring this to what you want. So, if there's a group of people that want diet work, yeah, that's another. I know there, there is interest for this, and I know Ray is waiting for this one-on-one with you on the stage. Okay. Right now, okay. So perhaps tomorrow morning, perhaps some diet, do a whole diet group with the whole group. Yeah. Um, yeah. And maybe when it's not possible, I would like to speak to one of you with the direction, so I can practice it anyway. Okay. okay. Thank you. Very good. Okay, we'll open it up to, if anybody wants to come up. Yeah. Ray was here yesterday, and, and we put it on pause, but now we're, we're continuing. <laughs> Hello. Is it, is it on? Yeah. We'll give it a little extra boost. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm here is because I, I was very afraid to come up. That's one of the reasons. Uh, beautiful. Okay, that's the first thing accomplished right away. <laughs> Excited to, to, to meet you, and I didn't really meet you. Yeah. And now I do. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, beautiful. So sometimes I experience uh, my feelings like I create this world every second. But that isn't true. There are two, two worlds, like, uh, like the color set, the true world, and mm -hmm. the, that's what I see with my body. Mm -hmm. I know they are, they are at the same time they are here. I'm not good at words, but... You know what yeah, it's right in this moment. They're, they're right here. They're so close. Yes. It's so close. It's yeah. closer. So close. It's, it's here. No. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so beautiful to think that uh, 
that I remember when I was reading the Course and, and I saw the phrase, the, the maker of the world, but the maker part was capitalized. And, and I said, what's that? A capital maker? And that's the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit has, has given us the real world and given us the happy dream. And I, I don't know about a lot of you, but I was raised with uh, the Bible. And eight years. Eight years. <laughs> and I think one of the most common, the most common known phrases in the Bible was that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And in A Course in Miracles, Jesus says, it's pretty good, it's close. <laughs> I love how, you know, it's like, come on, it's the most popular saying in the Bible. <laughs> only Jesus could say, close. <laughs> and He says, it should be, He gave it to His only begotten Son. God so loved the world, that He gave it to His only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in Him shall never perish, but shall have eternal life. He, he's talking about the happy dream. He's talking about the real world. God gave us a happy world in answer to the ego's insane request for a world of separation and conflict and division. God so loved the world, He gave you the happy world. He gave you the happy dream. And, and whosoever forgives, or whosoever accepts the atonement, will see this happy world. Uh, how beautiful! And what I like about the Course is it takes all these Bible phrases, even some of the ones that I, I used to say, oh my God, it's the worst, how can you, how can you deal with it, Jesus, you know? Uh, there was a line in the Bible that said, uh, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I thought, oh man, how do you deal with that one? <laughs> Jesus says, oh, it's easily reinterpreted. If you think of the Holy Spirit saying to your mind, Vengeance is mine, give it, give it back to me, <laughs> saith the Lord. In other words, that, that concept does not belong in your holy mind. Give it to me. Watch how I shine it away. Vengeance is mine, said the Lord. Translation for vengeance. They want to know. I don't know. I don't know. There we go. Lots of healing. Thank you, Calvin. <laughs> but that's that's it. If that can be retranslated, then we can anything can be retranslated, right? So, isn't that beautiful? Yeah. I love that that God loves us so much that everything is open to retranslation. I don't have to say anything, but now it's coming up. No, I was always atheist, and it take me so long, a long, uh, take me some time to to love God and Jesus. That's thank you for that. That's wonderful. There was still there was something, but I'm so I love God. I love Jesus. I love I love human being. I love I love yeah. love. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel it. I feel it. <laughs> it's so precious. I, we have, uh, in the United States, we have a, in Salt Lake City, uh, it's uh, the Mormon Church. And the Mormon missionaries that go all over the world. And so, I like to go to Temple Square where there's hundreds of them walking all over the place. And uh, to meet them. And I met one young missionary, and 
She came up to me and she goes, I, I'm in love with Jesus. I said, I know exactly what you mean. And we, we have such fun together, you know, joining. Because it's, we can join in the presence of that love. And we don't have to try to pick apart theologies and you know, all those old things. It's too complicated. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> said about coming up here, that was an option. I felt straight away it was a yes, but then my um, ego kicked in and said, you are not going up there. And the fear just like pumping through my body. <clears throat> so I said, um, yeah, I don't even know why I need to come up here. <clears throat> so I said, if I'm going to come up here, you're going to have to make it easy for me. Um, so the best thing would be if I could sit in the front row because there'd be no blocks and if there's people then I might get frightened of coming up. And when I walked into the room, I was told, this chair is for you over there. So I knew. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, how it works, <laughs> clearing away the pathway, whatever we need. Oh. So I knew, you've got to get your ass up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and it's um, this total fear of being exposed. And I knew that this was going to be recorded, and that was the part of it, it's like, well, this is going out. You do not want to be heard. This fear of just stay out of the way as much as possible. And so really I'm just facing that fear. I think from last night it was just having the courage to, to keep stepping forward and to keep doing that. So as I'm here, it's starting to just um, mm. dissipate. Uh. Mm. That's, a, that's a testimony to it. just you're not hiding it and then just eases away it's only the protecting that makes it seem strong and it's only the sometimes the anticipation that is a time thing that makes it seem like such a big block and then when we move forward with what we're prompted to do or guided it's just like <clears throat> very Easy, soft, yeah. And sometimes we have to do that over and over, hundreds of times. We may say, okay, I'm a slow learner, but I'll do it, I'll try. We, oh, again, oh, it just keeps happening and happening, yeah. Yeah, that's what it feels like. It feels like I have these ideas about myself, like, you're unworthy, why do you want to go up there? Who the hell do you think you are to take up the space? Um, so these kind of like messages come in, but I'm not prepared to listen to them anymore. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot just to keep, just to keep going. But as you said, it just starts to ease, and I know that that eases me, so I can't hold back anymore. Mm -hmm. And this was just that opportunity not to hold back anymore. I have to say too, that you, you came all the way across from England to, uh, to Utah and when you showed up there at Camas, um, it happens to us periodically, but every once in a while someone is sent to us by Jesus that just is so 
open and so transparent and you came with such openness and such transparency that it just ignited a spark uh, in the community uh, with you coming. And, and also, uh, you had such a, a willingness and an eagerness, you know, like a puppy dog eagerness, <laughs> like with your little tail wagging, like, I'm here, I'm here for expression sessions, I'm here to take advantage of every single second. And that, that sparks everyone, that sparks everyone. Even people that have been there, living there for years, you know, they all felt it. Like, hmm, Kenneth is here. <laughs> like, Spirit dropped Kenneth in and then it just stirred things up. Uh, because you were like saying, well, no private thoughts, okay, here, let's go. And full steam ahead, you know. So, you know, it's sometimes you don't even see, I think, the blessing that, that you bring. You bring a huge blessing. And sometimes the ego will try to make you try to forget that. It always does that. We have these amazing heart openings and miracle experiences and then it tries to do the amnesia thing. <laughs> like in the movie Dark City, sleep. It just wants us to sleep, go back to sleep. Forget, forget. And yet, I think honestly, if we all looked at it, we could say, honestly we've had some amazing miracles in our life. And the ego is just trying to brush them under the rug and dismiss them. But sometimes I think that's why it's good to do like photo albums and collages and things like that. Because it's, we, we go through those and those memories come rushing back. I've had this thing where over the years I'd love to take, a, like during a closing circle I'll take my iPhone, my camera around the circle and all these beaming glowing faces at the end of the retreat. And people tell me that when I put those on Facebook, they just get high watching them. They're just like, whoa, all those faces and all that joy beaming just after we've gone through this experience. And we do need reminders. We need, we need lots of reminders. That's, that's part of how it goes on this journey. And that's part of our gift that we offer. So when I look at you, that's what I see. I see you, you brought a, a big gift. And it seems like every few years, we had a strawberry festival too. We had a, a man that came down, uh, it was part of this big circle down there a few years ago, and, and he was the same way. He just, he was so eager, like a puppy dog showing up. Let's practice this no private thoughts and, and no people pleasing. And, and again, everybody was really refreshed. Everybody was like, oh yeah, that's a reminder of the, of the, why we're all here. You know, we're doing this together. So thank you. I want to thank you for your willingness. And once again today, when you go try to stop you and say, yesterday, no way are you going there. Oh yes. Oh yes. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, David. Um, it's like the last time what we met, and um, I said, like, I wanted, I spoke to Lisa and said I wanted to meet meet with you before I left. And when I came and saw you, like, the whole thing just started shaking as I was looking at you, and you were just talking to me. I can't remember the whole conversation, but you just said to me, oh, when I was leaving, expect miracles. And when I walked out that door for like a whole month, it was just absolutely mental. And there was, I was doing nothing, but every encounter was just loving and people were, I, I didn't have to do anything. And it was just all happening, constantly, the whole time. And so I am so, so grateful um, to you and what you demonstrate. And to me, like, I find it very, very difficult to trust. But I do trust you. Mm.
process. trusting and guidance. I know that this can be tailored to every unique situation. And I seem to experience a kind of, how shall I put it, an involuntarily birthing channel from which there is no return. I spent last three and a half years un unwinding, not through the course, the first few years. I came from a job. I had the chance to choose my freedom from being in a job that I didn't like at all. I didn't waste a moment to choose and jump into the deep, not knowing what was coming. Then the first one and a half years, there was only one mantra. I have to do something. I have to do something because I have to take care of me. If I don't do it, who will? But by the idea of searching for another job, I felt sick. I couldn't put it up. I did the least thing, I, it, which was uh, mandatory to get some um, support from government in, here in Holland. When that was over, and in the meantime, I tried some things to, to start a practice. I spent many time and money for that, for living from my heart, but being in a practice to support people in finding who we truly are. I even flew to the United States, Ojai, California, for a three-day retreat on that. Many people got an answer what they had to have to do. And I got a very clear answer. It was, be my love. But I got angry, because what do you mean, be my love? I need to do something, because I, need, I have to take care of me. I cannot live or be, be your love. Come on. <laughs> and that's two years ago now. And somehow, although I feel fear, there seems to be a kind of awareness around me. I cannot describe it so clearly that I feel paralyzed to do anything that represents a kind of activity into the world. And I instructed Holy Spirit, you have to guide me specifically with an impulse or a knowing or a deep feeling if I have to do something to apply for social welfare or whatever. I need to know it. If I do not get any clear impulse, whatever, I won't do a thing. And in my experience, it has not come. And now the trust is really, really there that I have to because I mentioned it at the beginning of the retreat this month a few bills will not get paid my mortgage will not get paid this month so my question or my yeah little doubtful thing is could it be that I am although I feel fear every now and then but also a kind of rejoicing about this situation which normally would scare the hell out of me three years ago, for example, or even a year ago. Could it be that the guidance is somehow forced upon me in a way 
um, in spite of m my little self, there seems to be a kind of push that I seem paralyzed to do whatever would be logical or necessary or whatever to maintain a living or to to make a living. So this is my my wondering if I'm listening correctly or am I mixing things up here? Okay, well thank you for pouring that out. Uh, I mentioned yesterday there's a, a booklet that Jesus dictated to Helen Shuckman called The Song of Prayer. And in the Song of Prayer, Jesus has the most astounding line. It's the most astounding line. I remember when I first read it, I just, I had to stop. And it stopped me in my tracks. Because the whole pamphlet is on prayer. And the sentence starts, the secret of true prayer. So, I knew that these were, this was going to be extremely important, whatever he was going to say. He starts it off in the Song of Prayer. The secret of true prayer is to forget the things you think you need. That contradicts everything that any one of us has ever been programmed with. That one line goes opposite of everything. But he goes on to explain that line. He says, when you let it go, when you forget it, you let it go to the Holy Spirit. In other words, the things that you think you need, part of that past conditioning, and programming, and part of being human, actually. It's a very practical part of being human. When you let it go to the Holy Spirit, it is your offering, it is your gift to the Holy Spirit. So, that really turns things around. If, if my beliefs and my needs that I've struggled with and been cha so challenged by, tormented, even though I'll say tormented by, can be offered as gifts to the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit will receive them as gifts, that is taking one giant leap into trust. I mean, that to me, when I read that, I went, whoa, that's a step into faith. And for me, it seemed to be a stretch of, of five years where I had to just put that into play, where I, I didn't seem to have a place to live, I didn't seem to have any kind of regular income, I didn't have any kind of organizational support, I had no savings, I had nothing in the way of visible support, as the ego would judge it. And yet I was told to travel, which at the time, I mean I had thoughts of this, is very impractical. In fact, if I had some support coming in, or if I had savings, then travel would be a practical thing. But this, I had judgments that Jesus was being very impractical. And, and he kept assuring me, he said, no, no, I actually this is essential for what will come in your life and as a miracle worker. Because he, there's a part in the Course also that it's been nicknamed the Promise, just like the Bible has its passages, but the Promise passage of the Course, it's like Jesus is saying, in case you missed my lilies of the field speech 2,000 years ago. <laughs> Uh, which was quite poet poetic. Uh, he says, once you have accepted his plan as the one function you would fulfill, there will be nothing else the Holy Spirit will not arrange for you. Without your effort, he will go before you, making straight your path and leaving in your way no stones to trip on and no obstacles to bar your way. Then he goes on, it's like, is that enough? No, it's more. Not one seeming difficulty, but will melt away before you reach it. You need take thought for nothing. 
except the only function you would fulfill. Now that song of prayer sentence, the secret of true prayer is to forget the things you think you need, and that promise section, if you put them together, and you put, throw in some lilies in the field, uh, it's pretty clear that he's saying, I'm in charge of the plan, and I will take care of you as you perceive yourself, for as long as you perceive you have needs. I will meet those needs. The thing is, our past conditioning, we see only a limited number of ways that that can occur. You know, we don't see the miracle. We, we say, well, it's going to have to come there, 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 or I'm, in, I'm messed up if it doesn't come from one of those areas. Yeah, and the ego, my, of course, is talking to me, well, you are getting into debt now, so the stone is uh, still not unturned, <laughs> in a way. My ego is, is complaining now, Holy Spirit, if you are there for me, am I doing something wrong? Because, or is it for me to trust still in this happening now, seem seemingly, seemingly disaster, or whatever? Do you want me to trust in this? Because it's easy when it's already fixed before money is running out, yeah, and then, then it's already uh, replaced, it's easy to trust. But now it comes down to, do I still trust as the situation seems to unfold, and I don't know what is ahead. And I, so my, but because I do not hear it the way you do. The Holy Spirit is not guiding me so, so specifically, it's more about this feeling that I have inside, I notice the peace inside, me not panicking, and the somehow awareness of being in this kind of birthing channel, there's no way back, but it's all kind of vague, vague. Yeah, well, it's good to come back to the idea that, that it's the Holy Spirit's function to convince the mind. Mm -hmm. In other words, once we start to take <laughs> on, if we feel like it's our responsibility, to convince ourselves, or be convinced, then it's like usurping is taking the Holy Spirit's function. That's part of why, when I came here, that I had uh, Jenny and Francis and Helena come along, because they have been right where you're talking about. Uh, and it's taken a little bit different forms in each case, but but it's the same sense of, of developing the trust. In other words, the, the trust can only be strengthened when it seems like you're, you're reaching a point where you, you're looking around and you're saying, where's my support? And then, whoof, up underneath you comes strong support. And I know that as well. I've shared it for years, and, and Frances in her talks, and Jenny and Helena in the talks, have, this has been a huge part of sharing the parables of, of one thing coming up after another. Whether it's a road trip, whether it's uh, involving like Jenny with her, her son Victor, or debts that she's had uh, with Frances, you know, she had her own business, and, and houses, and, and all the things that the world says are those symbols of safety and security, and yet the call came in very strong was to let them go, let go of those symbols, and then again let the spirit of love come up underneath. It's almost like inviting the spirit to saying, show me. Show me the way. Yeah, me. Coming as a little child, yeah. you know. Little children are amazing to watch because they put their hand up at time and they, they're asking to be led. But they, uh, they have their hand up. And developing the ego and developing all this conditioning and programming, it's, it's really developing this sense of, I personally need to take care of myself. Right. We know in this world that there's one extreme of, of being dependent and 
feeling dependent on another person, on parents, on the government, on social handouts, on something. And it doesn't feel good to feel dependent on something that you perceive as outside yourself. Because there's a fear there, that that will go to the hand that is offering, it will be withdrawn. And there'll be desolation, there'll be, you know, great need and destruction and so on and so forth. And then the flip side, which is not always seen to be the ego, is this belief that I personally have the skills and abilities to take care of myself. This is heavily reinforced as, as mature, functioning, adult citizen. You know, that's what the role is. And when you play that out, you get a lot of kudos, a lot of praises. Oh, <coughs> done very well. You could hear parents, oh my child went to university for these years and has these degrees, now they're practicing in this, and enormous house. And lots of children, lots of children. <laughs> Educate them. Two or three degrees, I, I, I lost track. <laughs> um, PhDs and you know, this and this, there's a lot of pride. But the pride is in the autonomy of being able to personally take care of the self. And that's heavily reinforced as good, 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 great, that's super. And yet, when you go on a spiritual journey, Mother Teresa had to let go of it, St. Francis had to let go of it, St. Teresa, the little flower, had to let go of it. If you go back through history, the ones that have gone more into the <coughs> communion experience, it, East and West, Yogananda, Ramana Maharshi, you, know, you could go pick your saint, pick your avatar, everyone has had to go of letting go of this control mechanism of, I know enough from my past learning to take care of myself. Thank you God very much, but I got it. <laughs> I'm succeeding. And then, the, that construct of a mask, it, it grows older with time, and then it's got to face things, the ravages of time, like a body breaking down. You know, the body starts to break down, I've got good health insurance. Jesus, stay away. <laughs> the best health insurance. I can hire the best radiologist for cancer. And I've got, I've got a life insurance policy. I'm not going to let down my survivors. I've got a life insurance policy. It's a big one. Don't think I'll feel any guilt when I die, because my survivors are going to live a great life on my my life insurance policy. Well, if you stop for a minute, wait a minute, what is health insurance but a bet that you will get sick? You're plunking down money every month or every so often with a bet that you will get sick. And the only way that you collect on the bet is if you get sick. <laughs> Otherwise, you're just paying for everybody else to get sick. But no, you have to get sick. To collect on the best. If you don't get sick, you lose the best. And all the other ones that got sick, they get the benefits. It's crazy. And that's just with health insurance. Now with life insurance, that's a bet that you're going to die. And you don't collect on the bet unless you die. You have to die to collect to win the bet. That's insane. That's absolutely insane. It's absurd. It's absurd, the laws of this world. It's backwards and upside down. And so, if we come to the point and we say, ah, that's where the fear is coming up, is the ego is still wanting to assert its pride and autonomy, and I can do this better than you can, God. Except the mind that thinks it's separate and autonomous, is like a closed situation. It's not going to move at all without help. It needs, it needs divine intervention. It needs help in the, in the most sincere way. And so, you know, to me that's part of why I've come with, with Francis and, and Jenny and Helena, because they've had to face exactly what you're talking about in their own forms, in their own ways, 
And it's, it's put trust to the test. It's definitely put trust to the test. Because if it's never tested, and you just think, hmm, if my money runs out, if my savings run out, then I could sell this, 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 but if, and then what? If, you know, it's like the ego is always like working a way to see, how can I stay ahead of the game? Yeah. But it's perpetuating the game by trying to stay ahead of the game. You know, people say that how much life insurance is enough? How much health insurance is enough? How much savings is enough? You know, these kind of questions the ego likes, because it's got you. There are even support groups where, where millionaires have come to the support group because they have such a fear of losing their wealth. It's, it's absurd for millionaires to come to support groups and, and speak up, you know, and share their fears about losing their wealth. They got invested here, here, but the market's unstable. Frances had, one of her business was a financial planner, and so I said to Frances one time, what do you think about the stock market? She says, it's totally crazy. It's totally insane. If that's coming from a financial planner, then we can start to go, hmm, why, where am I investing? my time, my effort, my, my money? That's a good question. What am I putting it towards? How will this help my peace of mind? That's a good question. But once we start to get into the game of scarcity and trying to cover your bases and everything, it just seems to get more and more stressful as we go round and round. That's interesting what you're mentioning now, because I'm here I could pay this stay here because my mother offered it to me. And then I could not decline because I felt the, the urgency for me. But then she also got sad because she knows about my situation and she can come along with me, although she's 90 years old and physically getting uh, less, but her mind can be very sharp. And it was, yeah, it's nice to tell how spirit might work, because I was doubting whether I, or not I should go, because my money was running out, already gone, more or less. And uh, then she said, well, you know where to find my wallet to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And then I said, well, mom, I need to know 100% sure that I have to go, otherwise I will not spend the money. And I was doubting, doubting, doubting. A few weeks, weeks later, I told her, well, I'm still not sure if I have to go or not. And then she replied in a way that's not her way. She said, you have to go. You should not miss this opportunity. You need to go there. And her, only, her own way of speaking is, well, David is coming so close. Don't you think it would be good for you to go there? You know, it's, maybe it's better, but now you have to go. Okay. <laughs> so I, I knew, and this was a very clear sign from the Holy Spirit, that there is no choice. You have to. So then I was convinced and crying, as okay, it was clear. And, and then she offered, a few weeks later, she felt sad because she saw my position of running out of this money. And then she said, well, I feel so bad because I have it in store and you can use my money because then you're, you will remain out of trouble and don't you think it's better that... When I have it and I'm old, once it will, it's not so much, but I could go on for a few more months. <laughs> Shall I, don't you think you should take it from me? And then I, then I could feel clearly, no, 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 I should not do that because this is a, a repair, temporary repair, but it's also an... Um, I'd still... Uh, this is postponement, delay of... Trusting that some kind of solution will come up. I, I don't think that this is the solution that, that is... It could be a solution sent from Holy Spirit to get me going for a while. <laughs> she, was, she was even wondering if she was used. Like she was used. But she was wondering, she told me, well, is it not that I'm used? To now, the Holy Spirit is using me to tell, to give you this offer, and, but I declined. I, I declined. 
Yeah. Yeah. Part of part of what it does too is is it starts to bring us to to go more inward, uh, like. Marianne was talking about the Aboriginals and the Native Indians and everything. Part of their process has, has always been looking within and examining the mind. Because we've come from a position where the definition of a need and the definition of a want gets blurred. The ego can just go on and on. I need, I need, I want, I want, I want more, I want more, I want more. That's, that's basically a synonym for the ego, is more. Uh, Jesus says in the Beyond All Idols section, uh, uh, What is an idol do you think you know? An idol is for something more. It does not matter more of what. So, we could rename the ego more. Gimme, 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 more, 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 more. It has, it's like a bottomless pit. It just, it's sacrifice, it's scarcity, it's, it's needing and wanting. And then, when we look at, at, at needs at times, that's where the Spirit's coming in to say, as you perceive yourself, let me help meet your needs. Because we have to build trust and eliminate fear. And so, that's where the trust comes in of like, of offering up the prayer and not being a judge of the form in which the need is, is met. That's where the pride comes in, is when the pride rears up sometimes and says, oh, I, I couldn't do this, I couldn't do that. You know, it, and then we have people like of the Aborigines and so forth that, that seem to live out in nature and uh, it reminds us more and more, their lives are more like the, the sparrows or the bird, keep your eye on the sparrow, yeah. the, the lilies of the field, look at the, the birds of the air, you know, they, how they survive. And, and St. Francis was always looking at nature and the birds, seeing that they needed a few berries a day. And they were off singing all day long. Sing, 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 a couple berries. Sing, 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 you know. It's not, they're not thinking about life insurance, health insurance. Like, how am I going to repair my house? And, oh, the eating, you know, it's a couple berries and off singing all day long. You know, that, St. Francis was good to point that out. Like, look at them. Look at the birds. Look at the birds. Uh, some of the now people. it's lunchtime. Oh, it's lunchtime. Okay. Speaking, of, speaking of berries. <laughs> okay, we're practical. I like that. Very practical. <laughs> Okay, um, maybe